Hello everyone, Jackie Jones and this is the third um, module of Lecture 3 about negotiation. This module being about the importance of communication in negotiation and for you also to put your thinking cap on as to how ethics um, comes into play in negotiations. The importance of communication, we've talked a lot about communication, um, how to be an effective communicator, what that means, um, recapping on it's not just what we say but how we say it and how we present it, um, our oral communication, our body language, our written communication, our, it all is fundamental building blocks as to being an effective communicator and this is very um, evident when we start um, being involved in negotiations. So uh, uh, my apologies for those who um, know the orange story but I'm going to use it as an example of, the, of how to explain the interest-based model. So slide four we've got a lovely picture of an orange there and so what we have as an analogy is two sisters and they both want an orange. So if we just stay there and you close your eyes and you think, okay, two people want an orange and we've got one orange, what's the obvious solution? And I think everyone would say, well, you just cut the orange in half. I mean, that's an obvious way of dealing with it. Give half an orange to one sister, half an orange to the other. Problem solved. The only thing is they both actually wanted the whole of the orange. Now, if we were negotiating this from an interest-based model, you would ask questions in an effective way to unpack that story, unpack why they want the whole of the orange. And as you ask questions in an, uh, in an effective way, asking the open questions and reframing and drilling down, you'll find that Sister One actually wanted the juice of the orange. That's what she wanted. She wanted a whole orange but just the juice and would throw everything else away. And then, as unpacking what the other sister wanted, her interests, her needs, her concerns, what was it all about? She would then explain that she was really looking for the peel of an orange for the cake. She was going to make an orange cake for someone's birthday party. And uh, that's what she wanted. She didn't want the juice. She didn't want anything other than that grated peel, the outside of the orange. So now that we've got an understanding of what both of those people wanted with an orange. Can you, sitting there listening to this lecture, now start thinking about other options that could exist for these parties? So our initial reaction of just cutting it down the middle and giving half each gave them some degree of satisfaction but didn't really meet their needs. And so by then thinking, okay, well we give give one sister the orange to squeeze it, the whole of the orange for the juice, then it goes to the other sister to grate it and to use the peel for a cake. Both have their interests, their needs, their concerns satisfied with having the whole orange. And I know that it might seem a little simple and it might seem trite, but hopefully it gets you thinking that by asking the questions and finding out what is going on, what is it that's just rather than I just want half that orange, I want the whole of the orange. Thinking about the questions to ask, thinking about how we can have a greater understanding of the interests and the needs of the people involved in this negotiation so that we can actually have a bigger pool of options for them to consider in in then ultimately, hopefully, fingers crossed, getting a resolution of the matter. It's worthwhile remembering, of course, that people have differing approaches to negotiation and that might rest on um, their own personality, for example, people that just avoid conflict. Remember, we talked about conflict and how important that is, going back to that. Some, party may, some people make a submission or they compromise, give and take. Um, or people might naturally be competitive or embrace the collaborative, cooperative approach. So it's important to have an understanding and appreciation of how people do come into a negotiation. And that doesn't mean that they're going to be transfixed in that particular approach. 
what it does mean is an understanding and a recognition by you as to where they're coming from and what you need to work with to be able to assist them in achieving an outcome because we can dress it up as much as we like. But the bottom line is when we're negotiating, the aim is to in fact achieve an outcome that the clients are uh, wanting to embrace, that they're prepared to live with and therefore to um, deal with the issue. And so um, how you deal with the issue um, of the application of approaches can be linked to skill level and expertise. And in this regard, I'd encourage you, if any of you are interested in dispute resolution, to in fact engage in other um, learning outside of university. There are a number of organisations that run very good um, programs and training sessions on, for example, mediation, um, and that helps to focus and identify the skills that we, we need to improve on. Um, questioning techniques, what does it all actually mean? Now slide 8 has a YouTube clip um, which I actually find very funny. Um, it's all about communication. I'm just going to leave it with you. If you've got time to um, click on it and, and have a watch, please do. Every time I watch it I always have a giggle. So I'd love your feedback as to whether you find it amusing as well. So let's just have a look at um, things like communication. I'm sure you've I've heard that word now so many times, you're wondering if I've got another word in my vocabulary. But understanding rather than changing the other client's perspective of the problem. Very important also for your client interview. What is the client's perception of the problem? Not what they're saying to you exists, but unpacking that to have a deeper understanding. Um, making sure that you are listening. You don't learn when you're doing all the talking. So it is all about, as we talked previously in effective communication, just um, being uh, restrained, being um, disciplined in taking on board what other people are saying and actually listening to what they're, the words they're using rather than just thinking what you have heard them say. Now part of the um, important aspect of an interest-based negotiation model is creating options. Now options are not offers and what that means is that there's no criticism. So when I'm for example negotiating and let's talk, give an example of um, maybe the parties have had a mutual interest of the accommodation for each other. So where they're going to live with their children is an important aspect and it's an interest to both of them. So before dealing with options there would be more unpacking of what does that actually look like to those parties. What does um, their accommodation look like to them? So in one negotiation I was recently involved in it was okay explain to me what that's looking like for you. To get the client to talk about whether it's a backyard whether it's um, a property that has to have a garage, for example. How many bedrooms? Is a townhouse suitable or a flat or a unit or a house? What is it that they are envisaging um, is their uh, need for accommodation? And then when you have that idea, it's then dealing with, well, okay, what are the options? How can we achieve those interests? And there may be, for example, a family home. So what's options relating to that family home? Well, it might be that the husband lives in the family home with the children. It might be that the wife lives in the family home with the children. It might be that that house is sold. It might be that the house is rented out. It might be that the house um, is going to be lived in by one of the parties for six months and then sold. And so you actually start unpacking lots of different options relating to a particular interest. Now the important thing about options and this is um, something for you to take on board and try in your negotiation um, scenario on the 5th of January is that 
there's no criticism, there's no commitment that is made or any comment made about options. It's literally just getting them out there, getting, getting ideas rather than options. Maybe ideas is a better way to be thinking about it. What ideas can we just brainstorm to deal with this issue? And it's only after that you have exhausted all the possible options that um, exist in relation to the interests, then you can then start drilling down and seeing what works, what doesn't work. Um, sometimes when I'm negotiating, I even will um, put uh, an option out there that I know both parties won't agree to. So for example, with that scenario of the house, it might be, well, the house could be transferred to um, a charity or sold and the whole of the proceeds transferred to a charity or something a little bit extreme, a little bit out there. And what happens is that often they'll look and they think, oh no, I don't want that to happen. And so all of a sudden you've got people agreeing on something that um, before actually coming into the negotiation process, the concept of agreeing to anything has been very challenging for them. So as I said, it, the hard work is in the generating of the interests and then using that to detail all the options that can be explored um, on those particular interests. Now in negotiations, an, an important aspect is objective standards. And how do we resolve the issue? So one party might say, look, I have a business um, and the business is worth nothing. It's me, um, don't have a huge turnover. And the other person might be thinking, well, I just don't think that's right. We've had a good lifestyle. They used to tell me that the business is doing well. The business must have a value. I think it's going to have a, a X value. And so you're going to have people with differing views as to values of assets, for example. How do you resolve that? Using an objective standard is, is the logical and widely used way. So engaging a third party, a forensic accountant, for example, a real estate valuer, someone who values um, chattels to come in and to give an objective standard on those values so that that takes away the issue between the parties. That certainly happens in the litigious process so that um, if there is something in dispute, experts are engaged to try and minimise the issues between the parties. So just remember, um, before you start discussing offers in a negotiation, not only should you exhaust the interests of the parties, both parties, because what you're wanting to do is make sure that everything has been discussed if possibly can, and then explore all options that are available for the identified interests. Now, a bit of a tip, the, the best thing to do is to start working on options for mutually identified interests. Work with things that are easy first. There are going to be challenges in negotiations when you get to pointy ends and you get to areas where there isn't any agreement. So identify the mutual interests of the parties and, you, and, and work on the options of those mutual interests first and see if offers can then be identified to deal with that particular aspect. Now, if you don't agree, um, there's two scenarios called a BATNA and a WATNA. A BATNA is the best alternative to a negotiated outcome. What's your client's? What's theirs? Every time you go into a negotiation, you should have an understanding of what your client's best alternative to um, not reaching an agreement in the negotiation. It might be having another um, negotiated ag agreement date. It might be going to a different form of uh, mediation. It might be going to arbitration. Um, it might be a particular dollar figure. Um, but there's going to be uh, something that is the best alternative to um, getting a negotiated outcome. Likewise, you should have an understanding and a thought process to what would your client's worst alternative to a negotiated outcome be. It's not always going to court. Um, it might be, for example, if your client was a creditor, um, if the party became bankrupt and individuals go bankrupt and companies go into liquidation, um, that might be the worst alternative because they are then um, amongst uh, a list of creditors and the chances of getting um, the full amount of money due and owing to them um, might be slim. So think about that and uh, 
you know, sort of discuss that with the client before you go engage in a negotiation. So a successful outcome, um, really the only certain outcome is one that is negotiated. An outcome that is determined by the court is one that is inherently uncertain, unpredictable, and um, every lawyer on both sides of the fence will say that there is some degree of um, substance to their case and strength to it. So uh, this negotiating an outcome gives the parties the opportunity to achieve the outcome that they can live with. That there has been compromise, but um, at the end of the day, it's something that at least um, they can move on with their life and hopefully maintain relationships. There are some practical aspects about negotiation though, where to negotiate and what is the most effective mode. Um, this can be very important. I did a negotiation uh, last year where my client, um, where there were three, there were two lawyers and a, a coach who was a neutral coach and that coach was um, a mental health professional. And the question was where we were going to have the first meeting because we couldn't have it in the mental health professional's um, office. And the other solicitor um, kindly volunteered um, the rooms that were about their conference room. My client was very hesitant, felt uncomfortable about it. And we thought, that's fine, not a problem. We went to the Law Society rooms, um, mediation rooms. They split the cost of it, and then after the first meeting where my client had an opportunity to meet with the other solicitor, see how the process went, he then said to me later, look, I have no difficulty if we go to um, the other solicitor's office for future meetings. So just think about that. Um, but there are challenges with telephone negotiation. People are skilled in it, um, and there certainly um, is a place for it. Um, but just uh, think of some challenges, and they're, they're um, outlined on slide 16. So all, all in all, after these three modules on negotiation, what's your role? Well, don't forget that your duty is as an officer to the court, and that's above your duty to your client. The most important thing in negotiation is don't get emotional about the issue. It's not your matter. It is the client's matter. And remaining objective is the best thing you can do for your client. You may need to pull the client back. You may need to give them a reality check. Um, see yourself as working with the other side rather than having um, a scenario of being in a positional s situation so that there is, in fact, no gain occurring. What is important also is to be prepared, and that is to have the appropriate tools available. Clients are visual, um, so have whiteboards or butcher's paper, whatever it um, can be used to get the clients to actually engage with this process. And finally, the challenge for lawyers. Their um, cultural and behaviour of lawyers can be very challenging in negotiations. Um, there are complexities in negotiations that can involve culture and numerous other issues as stated on slide 18. Don't forget that the negotiation is still a process where um, the ethical framework of our profession remains. Um, please be connected with your duties and responsibilities to your fellow practitioner and to your client under the uniform conduct rules um, and uh, be mindful of um, your need to um, deal with those ethical issues in an appropriate manner. So finally, it is all about working together and I hope that after um, listening to these three lectures on negotiation and with the material that is online, you will gain an appreciation of how beneficial an interest-based negotiation can be. And of course, we'll work more on that on the 5th of January and give you an opportunity to be um, involved in that scenario. So take care and that's the end of the lecture.